As Israel's assault on Rafah and other parts of Gaza intensifies, putting over a million people at further risk, the plight of health infrastructure and health workers also continues to deteriorate. Hospitals and clinics across the territory have been under consistent attack for months now and many health workers have been abducted and tortured by Israeli forces. Aid agencies have also been unable to carry out relief missions due to the extent and nature of the Israeli attacks. We go to Anna to understand the severe pressure faced by health workers and how they continue to work despite such harrowing conditions. And a very horrific situation uh, entering in Rafah in the southern part of Gaza. Of course, we know that a large segment of the population of the entire region had moved to Gaza and now they're facing attacks. Also, extreme pressure on the health infrastructure in the area. So, could you maybe for, could you first take us through what is happening right now on that front? Well, to begin with, uh, we have to uh, know that uh, in this region, there, there are no, not actually any major hospitals that can receive the amount of patients that uh, are expected to be received in uh, in the next hours and in the next days. Uh, international organizations have already warned about the effects that it, this would have. Also because we know that um, the hospitals that are still functional in Rafa, uh, those are field hospitals which have been erected uh, since the health infrastructure has been destroyed amidst uh, Israeli attacks. Uh, but also some uh, some of the hospitals that are there are uh, specifically ma maternity hospitals uh, like the uh, Emirati Hospital. So we do know that uh, women and children have been disproportionately wounded and affected by the attacks. And so this is only uh, only likely to continue uh, as the as the attacks go on. Then the next thing to know is that of course uh, there are uh, larger hospitals in Han Yunis. Uh, including Nasser Hospital uh, and Alamal, but of course both Nasser and Alamal uh, they have been uh, under siege and under continuous bombardment over the past well uh, over two weeks now. Uh, so uh, Alamal, which is associated to the Palestine Red Crescent Society, uh, has posted over and over again testimonies about the hospitals being hit, about patients being targeted about ambulances uh, being destroyed. Uh, over the weekend, they have reported that uh, Israeli soldiers have come into the hospitals, they have damaged the equipment, they have threatened people, they have beaten health staff. When they were leaving, uh, they, the Palestinian Red Crescent Society said that they essentially took the keys of the ambulances, they locked the wheels. So uh, essentially, uh, there, there was no way of, of using the vehicles that, that, that were still there. Uh, this is certain to have an impact because we know that people are trapped all over the place. There is no way to reach them. Uh, they keep calling, but there is no way to to uh, to go to the places where they uh, where they uh, where they are. Uh, then again, in Nasser, uh, we do know that people uh, were killed uh, by Israeli soldiers targeted over the weekend again, uh, as warned by the Sun Center and uh, uh, and other Palestinian civil society, civil society organizations. So 20 people uh, which who were just around the hospital, something that shouldn't be ever ever the case, uh, is happening on a, on a daily basis now. But Anna, in this context, of course, uh, health workers among those uh, segments which are really bearing the brunt of some of these attacks and offensives also because they're out on the field, they're at risk. Could you take, could you take us through what is happening? What are the kind of reports you're getting regarding what health workers are going through at this point? Well, at this point, uh, I'm afraid that the reports that are, get, are getting out are those who are confirming the doubts and the fears that people have expressed since the first health workers had been taken by the Israeli occupying forces. So now uh, it has been over a month. It has essentially been weeks since some of them had been held in prisons. Uh, some of them have now been released, but uh, when, when released, they show signs of undergoing extreme torture. They bear testimonies of being humiliated and beaten and tied, uh, stripped and paraded uh, in front of people while in prison. And this is something that, of course, uh, all the Palestinians who are imprisoned by Israel uh, express, experience violence and experience torture of some, some kind. Uh, but what health workers are reporting and what their comrades from, uh, from organizations in nearby countries are saying is that this is something that's being done on purpose. Uh, some of them even explain this as uh, when there are arrests, when there are disappearances by uh, among the Palestinians, 
once they reach the prisons, once they reach the camps, uh, essentially, there are two two categories of people. So there is the general population, and then there's the health workers. And the health workers are treated with extreme, extreme violence. With uh, they're essentially tortured and abused because not only because they're Palestinian, they're also tortured and abused because they're health workers and they bring hope. Uh, and the Israeli soldiers know that if they break them, if they humiliate them, if they dehumanize them, then there's a better chance of succeeding at. Uh, uh, at just you know uh, stopping stopping the resistance, but of course it has to be said that although all of this is happening, uh, we still see dozens and thousands and hundreds of uh, health workers who are essentially volunteering in Gaza's hospital. They're not being paid. Uh, many of them have been displaced for, from their original hospitals. They are now working at the second or third hospitals, and still. They're they're there to you know to provide care to uh, to fight with the people and to support them you know, as much as they can. And Anna, also, do we have any reports regarding you know the uh, the lack of supplies? How that has also been affecting the situation over there? Well, this is something that's been affecting uh, the whole supply chain. Of course, not only uh, not only healthcare. Uh, what we do know is that the majority uh, of the missions that had been planned since early January up to today. Uh, they had been made impossible by the Israeli uh, because they uh, have failed to provide the security assurances. They have just outrightly refused to let uh, let supplies in. Uh, some of those uh, some of those missions were WHO missions. Uh, WHO was recently supposed to go to uh, to Nasser Hospital. It was refused. Uh, so uh, while we know that the shortage of supplies there is uh, is horrific. Uh, the UN agency was not allowed to go in. And this is something that we're witnessing uh, across sectors. It is definitely something that's making uh, the health situation even worse because people do not have access to water, they do not have access to food, we do know that famine is looming. Uh, malnourishment is now essentially uh, something that, that that's a general general thing, widespread uh, among among the displaced, among those still trapped in northern Gaza. So, um, this, with time, of course, will add up to the public health situation, uh, which is another thing in itself because it has been more, it has been increasingly difficult to track the numbers. We do know that the spread of color, of uh, diarrhea, the spread of hepatitis uh, A is there, uh, but it is becoming increasingly difficult for the people, for the public health people there, to report the numbers because there's no supplies to essentially check why the people uh, are experiencing diarrhea, what uh, respiratory infection is uh, most widespread among the population. So this is something that's definitely, definitely being affected by the lack of supplies getting in. Anna, thank you so much for that update. A very uh, disturbing situation uh, as being reported by uh, organizations and activists across the world as well. We'll come back to you when there are more details. Thank you so much. Over 130,000 doctors are set to take collective action to protest a steep hike in the number of medical student admissions. The controversial move is being pushed by the conservative government of Yoon's, President Yoon suk Yeol as a supposed response to the growing shortage of doctors in the country. South Korea has the lowest doctors to people ratio among OECD nations. As Yoon eyes the upcoming parliamentary elections in April, the new plan is being met with strong resistance from the medical community, which argues that there is more behind the current shortage of doctors than just medical admissions. We talked to Anish for the details. Anish, South Korea, a country which has seen industrial action strikes by various sections of working people over the past uh, many years. Doctors have also you know, been protesting on various issues, but could you take us through what the latest uh, you know, uh, the latest strike is about, the latest protests are about? Well, at the, the heart of it, it is basically about the increase of uh, medical admission quotas uh, for uh, new entry, entries. And that is something that has really sparked a massive controversy in South Korea because obviously this is an, uh, a policy that was, uh, as per unions, has been pushed through in a haphazard manner. Uh, although South Korea is facing a significant uh, doctor shortage, medical health uh, professional shortage uh, over the past few years, something that is expected to rise and uh, you know be exacerbated with an aging population, uh, there has been no attempt uh, by uh, the, uh, the current government or even previous government to actually address some of the most core issues 
which apart from shortage also comes with uh, in terms of inequality and other issues that includes pay rise and everything. But for everything, the government has used uh, the fact that uh, medical admissions have be, have stagnated since 2006, uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, that uh, that that is the issue. That is the reason why uh, you know there aren't enough doctors and there aren't enough medical professionals in the country. And that is something uh, that the union is trying to protest against. And this strike is essentially uh, a call to bring attention to other major issues that is, uh, you know, that is basically uh, giving rise to this shortage in the first place. And this is why, and obviously it coming uh, very close to the parliamentary elections, which is said to happen later uh, this year, it is something that is uh, going to be quite significant uh, in the coming days. Well, uh, in this context, could you also tell us how the government has been kind of responding to the demands by the doctors and what exactly, uh, you know, what are the concrete demands, what are their plans? Well, uh, the government has, as usual, uh, threatened uh, any attempt for an industrial action. It is not just a strike that they are call, uh, that they are threatening the doctors against. They are threatening uh, basically any action, any collective action that might happen in the coming days. To the point uh, where they have said that they can uh, they can be uh, you know denied of their uh, certification to uh, you know continue practicing medicine. And this is something that is quite serious because obviously. In, most places, uh, if you're denied your certification or your uh, certification is revoked, it's usually because of medical malpractice or some something related. Here, it is strike action that is being used as a threat. Uh, and this has actually deterred uh, the junior doctors uh, union to, uh, to not declare anything as of now. They are trying to look for avenues to uh, show their protest. And that is something that clearly shows how uh, how anti-union the current conservative uh, union government is right now. Uh, the doctors, on the other hand, are putting out very you know reasonable demands. They're saying that the sharp increase that they're calling for, which is about two thousand doctors on top of the three thousand or something uh, admissions that are already happening, uh, new doctors every year annually, is something that is going to put uh, a massive strain on hospitals and the entire medical infrastructure. The fact is that there is not enough investment investment to actually bring in more uh, newer doctors to attract uh, the profession. Uh, there are specialties like uh, pediatrics, uh, maternity care, which uh, gynecology, which are not gaining enough uh, attention or enough uh, demand. And that is where the shortage is massive. Uh, including geriatric care. These are, uh, you know, areas where there needs to be more doctors, but something that is not being addressed because the pay is low. Uh, there is obviously problems with uh, legal, uh, uh, you know, issues that often complicates doctors and obviously violence against them, which is something that the uh, government has never really addressed. Uh, on top of that, there is the fact that in rural areas, much of the uh, much of rural South Korea does not really have a very good uh, health infrastructure. Uh, many places do not have dialysis centers, no matter how big the village or the towns are. So usually outside of Seoul, it's uh, it's a very backward kind of situation in most places where even physicians are rare. And most people uh, for you know serious health conditions, they have to actually travel hundreds of kilometers to Seoul uh, uh, to get treatment. And that is something that is also not being addressed because obviously doctors are do not get paid well there. There is not enough infrastructure, and obviously there is not enough, uh, you know, uh, career prospects to begin with. So very often you do not see many doctors coming to these areas. These factors are not being addressed. The government at this point has pushed through this, uh, you know, quota increase program primarily to, uh, with an eye on, you know, the current, uh, the upcoming parliamentary elections, and that is something that has incensed the doctors right now. They are asking for investments, they're asking for pay rise, they're asking for security, they're asking for better infrastructure that actually expands the medical health care to everybody. And that is something that the government has no plans for whatsoever at this point in time. Thank you so much, Anish, for the update. We'll watch what's happening in Korea over the coming days. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.
Oh, 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 oh,